Hello, this is Miss Dagenford, and I am going to continue our discussion on cell signaling by talking about receptors. And we already started this discussion with our bacterial quorum sensing uh, lecture and video, uh, and the yeast cells having the different types of receptors. So some of this should not come as a surprise. So really we're just kind of kneeling down some details. By the end of this video you should know three different types of receptors and we'll start how the signal gets conveyed or transduced. So this picture we started with the last uh, video. We looked at a um, a, a receptor. We're going to give this one a name. This is a G protein coupled receptor. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but this is a very, very important molecule. There are over a thousand G protein coupled receptors that we have in our body alone. And that's not even then including animals and plants and fungi. This is a very important eukaryotic receptor. Now, they all operate on the same basic principles. And so again, we've got our seven transmembrane. You can see them kind of looping back and forth, and those would have these nonpolar side chains to allow it to kind of anchor into the lipid bilayer. And then you're going to have a part on the outside that's going to create a receptor site, and then a part on the inside that's going to be binding to something called a G protein. It's thus the name. It's a G protein coupled. It's coupled with that G protein. So let's take a look at what these do. Now the receptor has a specific shape for the ligand and remember a ligand is just a signaling molecule that's going to be floating up and then binding to this site. <clears throat> now um, the G protein it, it exists in two states. If there is a GDP, and this is very similar to ADP, it's a guanosine diphosphate. And if there is a GDP, this is off. So I like to remember it as don't turn on, don't do anything. So just remember GDP, if it's attached to a G protein, nothing's going to happen. That is turned off. However, if you have a ligand that binds to the receptor, this is in number two, you are going to have a shape change. The conformation of the protein shifts, and we can talk about that more in detail tomorrow. This is now an activated receptor, and that activated receptor is going to interact with a G protein. You are going to now have a GTP, again, very similar to ATP, that's going to join to that G uh, protein, knock off that GDP. This is now activated. And just remember, GTP, turn them on, turn something on. And what is it going to turn on? Well, in this case, it could turn on an enzyme. It's going to activate an enzyme. And then this can go on and do um, multiple responses and turn things on. Now, those things could break things apart or convert things, but the idea is that we've now turned it on. Once that GTP falls off, now it becomes inactive again, and it's going to uh, link up with our um, membrane. It's going to stay in there, and it's going to move around. It's going to link back up to <coughs> our uh, receptor. Uh, so that's one of them. And uh, just as a neat application, bacterial toxins, since we've been talking about bacteria the last couple of days, Toxins can often interfere with a G protein uh, coupled receptor, and if that interferes with it, then that can cause all sorts of problems, cholera and um, um, other diseases. Well, they're going to mess up how our body works. Now, that, that was one receptor, so we've got three total. Remember, so we've got G protein coupled receptors, number one. And then we have what are called receptor tyrosine kinases. And um, these are going to act on a similar principle. We're going to have a ligand binding site. This time, these receptors have total six 
places that can be phosphorylated. And that's what we're going to be looking at what happens, what causes them to do something. Well, when you have our ligand, the signaling molecules coming into the little pockets, that's going to cause them to join together to form a dimer. That starts this little domino effect. So notice we've got these amino acids, these tyrosines that are sticking out and they will be able to activate once they have a phosphate on them. So along comes 6 ATP plopping those phosphates on them. Now we've got a fully activated receptor tyrosine kinase. What these then do is turn other things on. So the really cool thing about receptor tyrosine kinase is they can have multiple effects. You could have a cellular response one that could be telling something to build, but you could also have a cellular response two, which maybe is telling you to convert something else or turn something other, um, turn another enzyme on or off. So things can get complicated pretty quickly because this one could be turning on molecule A, um, it could be turning off molecule B. Um, this one could be turning C on and then and turning off D and all sorts of complicated pathways. Um, we're going to focus on how to understand these pathways, not necessarily memorizing these. So we've got the third one is a ligand gated channel. So here's our number three. Now, this one might look familiar to some of you if you dig back in your memory to anatomy and physiology, because this is how synapses work in our nervous system. We have our ligand, <laughs> no surprise there, a pocket to receive it, and once it binds to it, it's going to open that gated channel. So this is a, um, a facilitated uh, diffusion type of event where we're allowing things to come in. And then these molecules can cause things to happen. So we're going to look at some of these. Um, the ligand ch gated channels are more common in the nervous system, so we'll probably see that later in the week uh, or later next week. Uh, whereas these two are going to focus on the um, endocrine system and uh, some of the senses. The eye is a good example, too. You also <laughs> see the G protein coupled receptors in plants where they respond to light, or at least there's a system that responds to light. So pretty, pretty cool things. It's all over the place. Uh, now, we want to at least get started talking about transduction. So what happens when that, those switches get turned on? So this is propagating a signal. Uh, now, some of them are more um, obvious than others. Steroid hormones are, are one of the easiest to understand because they actually can go right through the membrane. They are nonpolar. They go right through those nonpolar lipid tails. And as they go in, so here's testosterone. As testosterone gets into the cytoplasm, it can then bind to a receptor protein on the inside of the cytoplasm. Now, here's where we get back into familiar territory. These receptors that are bound to the hormones can act as transcription factors that then latch on to certain genes and turn them on. So, hey, we we learned about them earlier. So we're just kind of putting in, connecting some pieces here. We know that there are transcription factors. What can turn them on and off? And in this case, steroid hormones, it's the actual hormone that, that does it. Um, <clears throat> so these can be growth factors. In the case of testosterone, it can cause the secondary sex characteristics, the growth of hair, the growth of skeletal cells and muscle uh, cells, um, or to signal to start making sperm cells. Now, we also get into a, uh, there's a more complicated version, and these I am not understanding that, understating that these are very complex and can get a bit crazy. Phosphorylation cascade. Well, a cascade, you want to think of a waterfall. And so things kind of tumble down a pathway. And so a phosphorylation cascade is when we see repetitive phosphorylation events. So 
here we start with something familiar. These are non-steroid ligands. Hormones. These are signaling molecules that bind. No problem there. They could be G protein coupled receptors or the receptor ty tyrosine kinases. But here we want to look at what happens on the inside. Well, here we have a molecule that becomes activated and it in turn activates a protein kinase that becomes activated. That means it has a little phosphor. Um, uh, a phosphate on it, that's going to turn on this protein kinase, which act is become active. That's going to in turn activate a third one that becomes active, and then that might turn on a protein, which can then do something. Now, why do we why do we use so many of these molecules? Well, there's something very interesting that goes on. This is also an amplification of the response because you can get one molecule turning on 10 molecules and each of those 10 molecules turning on 10 more. And so that amplifies that signal as well. So you can imagine what if there's a mutation in any of these uh, cascading molecules. If 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 um, this becomes mutated, well, you're not going to be able to turn these on. Um, now, in the meantime, maybe this turns on something else. And and again, how complicated it is? We'll look at a couple of these. But the idea is that you're passing the baton. To use another example, you're passing the baton from one molecule to the next and activating it until we then go to the cell response. So these are oftentimes the the first one in the in the pathway is often called the second messenger. So if I go back to my example of a of somebody knocking on the door, that would be the ligand. Uh, the guy who gets the message inside the the room would be the second messenger. And in this case, we have a very common one called cyclic AMP or adenosine monophosphate. So this looks familiar. Here's our ATP. Lo and behold, we remove two phosphates. We get a cyclic form. And what's going to happen is we get then our adenosine monophosphate. So we're going to switch back and forth between um, these two molecules. Well, let's go ahead and stop there. That's a good place to end for tonight. Please do take notes and watch this again. The questions are now going to be on the quiz tomorrow.